Today on Monkey Life. Tragedy at the park when Chimp Cherry loses one of her newborn twins. Little Louise is limp and gone. A stink fight at the Lima enclosure when two new arrivals are given a rough welcome. And a match made in heaven as Kim and Tien start work on their duet. in Dorset, set deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. For more than 25 years, the team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, has rescued and rehabilitated abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. You take a look at her and she's an old deer. The park now provides a home for more than 240 monkeys and apes from 20 different species. Its aim is to give them a safe and happy life in as natural environment as possible. At Hananya's enclosure, the chimps are unusually quiet. Baby Louise, one of Cherry's newborn twins, has died. We've had a bit of a tragedy. Came in and first thing this morning, little Louise is limp and gone. But Cherry is still clinging on to her little daughter. Doting Simon hasn't left her side. Because Cherry is such a good and focused mother, she's still carrying around little Louise and looking after her and caring for her and wishing her to still come back to life. You know, it's the kind of thing that you'd almost be in disbelief. I can't speak, I've never lost a child, but I can only imagine that somebody who has would want to hold on to that little baby and will it to take another breath. While Cherry is refusing to let go of Louise, her other twin, Thelma, is a little bewildered and holding on tight to her mom. It's really a little bit of a difficult and worrying time because where she's having to focus so much attention on supporting and caring Louise and her little limp body, Velma is having to cling tight and actually support herself a little bit more because Cherry's attentions are on Louise. Peggy and Arthur are doing their best to comfort Cherry and Thelma. Arthur has been besotted with the twins ever since they were born. Alison is puzzled over Louise's death. I'm not quite sure why she passed away. We know that the survival of multiple births is not likely in non-human grade apes, um, but we're gonna wanna know why. I want to know why, but we're gonna have to get Louise off of Cherry at some point in time. My gut instincts say that she hasn't had major trauma, she hasn't wasted away, and to me, the only thing to leave a perfect little healthy body like that is maybe she suffocated. And Looking at Cherry and those two babies, Louise was always tucked sort of down and under lower, sort of around her waist and carried a bit lower. And when she would make nests at night, Louise was always tucked right down in amongst everything, whereas Velma was sort of more front and center and up high. I'm wondering if there was just a very sad tragedy in the night at this point, and this is just speculation, but if when making the nest and falling asleep, you've got Velma, Cherry, the nesting material and everything, is it possible that little Louise was just sort of trapped in amongst all of that and couldn't get enough air in and simply suffocated and went in the night? But it is just a guess. And Alison believes it's important to find out exactly what happened. As soon as we are able to get hold of Louise, I would definitely send her off for a post-mortem, mainly just because I want to know if there was anything that we should have seen, could have seen, could have done for her, and perhaps more importantly, is there anything that we should be doing for Thelma? If animals die, a lot of the time, the information that you gain from tragic situations can be even more important than you gain from wonderful situations because it will help you avoid tragedies in the future. So, yeah, if we can get hold of Louise, we'll definitely be sending her off for a medical exam.
Away from Hananya's enclosure, spirits are much brighter. It's been several weeks now since golden-cheeked gibbons Tien and Kim were paired up, and it seems to be a love story in the making. Tien used to sing with his family, but started singing on his own a few months ago. That was one of the reasons staff knew he needed to move, as male gibbons do this when they're ready to look for a mate. But now, Kim has started to sing with him. This is a great sign that the two of them have hit it off. Golden-cheeked gibbons are found in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos, and in the wild they sing a short duet most mornings. This is to mark their territory and also to show their social status. The male and female have their own different parts of the duet to sing, but it takes a lot of practice to get it right. Kim's song is far from perfect, she hasn't got the hang of the big, high, strong notes yet. But she is hitting the smaller notes, and generally they're in the right place and at the right time. As for Tien, his song is more sophisticated than Kim's. But he's going to have to learn to adapt it so that Kim can join in. Eventually, she should take the lead. Kim still has a lot of growing up to do. At five years old, she was very young to have left her family and isn't fully matured. Over the next few months, she's likely to go through the colour change that happens to all adolescent female golden-cheeked gibbons, where they turn from black to blonde. They may not be the most tuneful of gibbons yet, but Kim and Tien certainly seem to have got off on the right note. Two more primates hoping to get off to a good start are just settling into their new home at Malagasy, the lemur enclosure. Twins Friedrich and Kurt arrived in Dorset last night. They were living at a zoo in Austria. But they've grown up and it's time for them to leave their family group. So Monkey World has offered to take them in. But lemurs aren't known for being particularly friendly to newcomers. So they're going to have to work hard to be accepted by the rest of the ringtails here. The two brothers were up at the crack of dawn, eager to have a look outside and spot their new housemates. Friedrich and Kurt are cautious. The team is going to introduce them to the other lemurs gradually. They know the ringtails are likely to give the twins a hard time. Normally, the lemurs are allowed to roam freely around their large outdoor enclosure, but it's been decided to contain them for this introduction just to be on the safe side. Himal, one of the youngest lemurs at the park, and Houdini, who is known for having a gentle temperament, are waiting to meet the boys who stick together nervously. Houdini heads straight for them, but they sense he's not about to make them feel welcome. Houdini rubs his wrists on his tail and then proceeds to flick it at them. It's a stink fight, and the brothers are not impressed. Himal sits on the sidelines, watching his friend Houdini load up again. Lemurs have scent glands on their wrists, which produce an odour. In the wild, this technique is used to resolve things like territory disputes and squabbles over food. Houdini is only a mid-ranker in the group, and he normally gets on with everyone but he seems determined to put the twins in their place. It's time for some of the others to get in on the action. 
and they all seem keen to make their mark. Dominant male Indiana starts scent marking, and Renton follows suit. Kurt shows he's no pushover by trying to claim a bit of territory for himself. But the lemur Kurt and Friedrich really need to win over is leader Fennel. Females are in charge in ringtail society, and she can protect them if she's on side. The brothers decide the best way to impress her is by throwing her some stink. You may need to work on your chat-up lines, boys. Coming up, happy news for woolly monkey Zingu. Zingu's going to be a fantastic mum. I can't wait to see her with a baby again. And Fabian outsmarts his fellow capuchins to become king of the termite mound. There's excitement at Oaxaca's woolly monkey house. Zingu is pregnant. These South American primates are highly endangered in the wild and extremely difficult to breed in captivity. So this is great news, especially as Oaxaca is the father. He's extremely valuable to the breeding program because he's wild caught and has only had one baby so far. So his bloodline is very important. It's tricky for the team to guess when the baby's due, although staff do keep detailed records and they know that woolly pregnancies last seven and a half months. Well, when we look at Zingu's chart, which is just here, Zingu was seen mating around about March time. So when we're looking at it now, it means that she's probably only got another few weeks to go. This isn't the first baby for Zingu. She has had one before, but sadly she lost it early on as a result of a bacterial infection. Zingu's baby, unfortunately, did pass away uh, at about nine days old. Fingers crossed it's all going to go well this time. All we can do really is make sure that Zingu is as healthy as possible. Despite the tragedy, Zingu did show great maternal instincts, so the staff are very hopeful. Zingu's going to be a fantastic mum. I just, I can't wait to see her with a baby again. She's so attentive. She's so proud of her baby as well. The last time when she'd given birth, she sat at the window of the house and waited for us to come in and see her. And she showed the baby off to us and was just so proud of it, but very, very protective of it. So she was a brilliant mum. Zingu has learned a lot from her mother, Yurima, about how to rear babies. Yurima is now the dominant female in Chippy's group and still has two children to look after, two-year-old Ava and four-year-old Enzo. Although Chippy is the boss in his group, it's Yurima who rules the roost. Fruit makes up a large part of a woolly monkey's diet, and today they've been given a special treat of grapes on the vine. But they're having to work for them. Paolo is now six years old and very confident. He has no problem getting to the grapes, but suddenly develops butterfingers. Bronco, who's a boisterous young male, has chosen a basket further down and goes off to enjoy his reward in peace, leaving Chippy to nip in and feast on the leftovers. Bronco doesn't seem to mind. There's plenty for everyone. Chippy is using his prehensile tail, which acts as a fifth limb, to get to the goodies. And young Enzo is copying him. But he hasn't quite mastered the art and gets himself tied up in knots. Yurima decides it's time her daughter Ava got a look in. But boss Chippy is hogging her basket. Yurima politely persists and Chippy eventually gets the message although he grabs plenty to take with him. Ava seems quite happy fishing out the grapes on her own, so Yurima leaves her to it. But greedy Paolo is waiting in the wings and swoops as soon as the coast is clear. Ava gives up on the grapes. She's decided there's an easier way to get food. So while the others are still munching on their grapes, she hunts out her mum again, whom she's still feeding from. Zingu has all this to look forward to.
There's only one Saki monkey at the park, and he's called Jethro. The team don't want any of the residents to live alone, so have tried to introduce him to several different primates since he arrived two years ago. Recently, he's been living with cotton top tamarin Uncas, who was also on his own having lost his partner Alice. And, for a while, the unlikely pair did live quite harmoniously. But they've had a squabble, so they've been split up. Jethro is now living with the squirrel monkeys, who he's lived with before. And that seems to be going quite well. He doesn't interact with them very much, but seems to enjoy their company. He also loves their big enclosure, where he can potter around and sunbathe to his heart's content. As for Uncas, well, he's about to have a new playmate. The staff are making a few modifications to the house as an elderly male cotton top who has recently lost his mate is due to arrive any time. We don't know exactly what his mobility is like, but it could be that it's not that great. So we just want to put enough in so that we know that he can get around well enough. Obviously, he's going to be a bit unsure. It's a new room and new people as well. So we just want to try and make him as comfortable as possible. And if, if he arrives and he's moving around really well, we can always take some of it out. And also, if he seems to be struggling still, we can add more in. So it's just to try and help him out, really. Uncas and his previous partner, Alice, were named after characters out of the historical novel, The Last of the Mohicans. As Uncas's new friend doesn't have a name, the team have decided to continue that theme, calling him Hawkeye. Hawkeye seems quite nimble for his 18 years and is moving around the house well. So it's time for him to meet Uncas. Uncas goes straight over to introduce himself. The two are clearly intrigued by each other, but are keeping their distance. Uncas moves around the room, keen to let this newcomer know that he was there first. Hawkeye decides to retreat to a back bedroom. Maybe he needs some time to adjust. But Uncas is hot on his heels, determined not to let him out of his sight. Whether Hawkeye likes it or not, he seems to have acquired a new best friend. Cotton tops are just one of many monkey species at the park, but the cleverest of all of them are the capuchins. The team has decided to put their intelligence to the test by building a mini termite mound out of an old drain pipe. Staff have put tubes into the pipe, which they're filling with rice pudding. The monkeys will have to work out how to get it. If they're crafty enough, these sticks of bamboo should help. Felipe is first on the scene. He's a high ranker. He lifts one of the sticks and finds food on the end, but discards it not realising he could use it to get to the rice pudding. A crowd is now beginning to gather, and young Fabian is next to investigate. He too grabs a stick and tastes the rice pudding, but again throws away the secret weapon. When he tries to go back to the hole, Felipe scares him off. Marcy has joined Felipe now, and brave Fabian tries to sneak around the back. But Felipe spots him. Marcy and Felipe are baffled, so Felipe decides to call it a day. It's time for leader Winslow to show the others how it's done. But with no bamboo sticks left in the holes, he's not sure how to proceed. So tries to get to the yummy treat with his fingers, with high-ranking Fiona joining in. Meanwhile, young Fabian is hatching a plan. Frustrated Winslow has resorted to licking the pipe for any smears of rice pudding. He may be the boss, but on this occasion, he's lacking the brains. Winslow gives up and bows out. Fabian immediately leaps back on. He has an idea which he's desperate to try. Top marks for Fabian, he's cracked it. 
but before he has a chance to indulge, Felipe's back. However, he hasn't been paying attention. He tries to work out what Fabian's done, but hasn't a clue. All eyes are on him. It's all a bit embarrassing for the cocky capuchin. He has to admit defeat. Fabian may not be very high in the pecking order, but he's managed to outwit all his compatriots. Next time on Monkey Life. A special trip to Vietnam for Alison to release two more golden-cheeked gibbons back into the wild. We're just a short trek now away from the release site. So far, so good, and they're looking good. But there's trouble when a rival male appears on the scene.